Hey, hey, Barbie people. In this installment of learning about fabrics, we're going to deep dive into knits. I have like maybe 500,000 things about knits to share with you all, but I only have so many minutes before I lose your attention span. So I'm gonna break it up into a few different videos. In this video, we're gonna kind of go over the basic categories of knits. And then I'm gonna show you a bunch of swatches. Future videos, I'm gonna cover design considerations for patterns like Fair Isle versus uh, Jacquard versus Intarsia, and texture methods like create, you know, using different stitches like tuck stitches and cables and moss stitches and all that good stuff. Tubular knits, partial knitting, AKA short row knitting, all that stuff. Okay, so in this one, I mean, we have to start with the basics, right? If you watched my first learning about fabrics video, then you know that all fabrics have two components, fiber content and construction. Okay, so when someone says, what's your favorite fabric? And you say silk, that's not a thing. That's not a fabric, that's fiber content. Okay, silk comes in many, many, many forms, uh, as you may have seen if you watched my silk swatches video. So fiber content, and construction. So fiber content is, you know, man-made fibers like polyester and uh, natural fibers like silk, wool, cotton, etc. Now, on the construction side, we have four main categories. We have wovens, knits, non-wovens, and hides. And you may be thinking, well, if you have wovens, then everything else is non-wovens, right? <laughs> I mean, technically that's true. <laughs> I mean, I feel like, okay, I get it. But yeah, so non-wovens, what we call non-wovens is this category that is not woven knit or hide. <laughs> but that's too long, so we just call them non-wovens. And that includes things like felt. Basically, felt is when you take a bunch of yarns and you just tangle them together like you caught them at the bottom of a shower drain. And so when you, like... You can't unravel felt. Okay, that's what makes it great for like uh, children's arts and crafts because you can cut and it won't unf uh, fray or unravel because it's just tangled yarns. Okay? And uh, non-wovens category also includes things like vinyl. You know, that clear color vinyl accents was a huge trend for like a hot second. And then hides are leathers and furs. Okay, so let's talk about knits. Okay, knits versus wovens, just for comparison's sake. So wovens are when you have, you know, straight grain fibers, yarns, excuse me, and cross grain yarns, and they go up and over and under each other, woven, right? Kind of like this, at, you know, 90 degree angles from each other to create different patterns and textures. Knits are a series of loops. Loop de loop de loop de loop. Okay. All knits fall into one of two categories. We have weft knitting and we have warp knitting. Weft knitting, the loops go across the grain, cross grain. Loop, 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 loop. Have you ever knit a scarf? You know, let's say you want to go across 20 stitches. You know, you choose your yarn, you choose your needles, needle size, and you knit 20 stitches across. And then you go back 20 stitches. So you're going, you're knitting across the grain. Loop, 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 loop. Loop, 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 loop. Loop, 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 loop. Warp knitting, the, the loops go along the selvage, along the straight grain. And so it goes up. Okay, it loops up. And you can do machine weft knitting and machine warp knitting. I have not heard of anyone hand warp knitting. Okay, to my understanding, all hand knitting is weft knitting. Or I guess all traditional hand knitting. If you can figure that out, more power to you. So let's tackle these categories one at a time. Weft knits first. With weft knits, you have knit stitches and purl stitches, and it's all a series of knits and purls. All right, so this is what knit, stitch, uh, knit stitches look like. This is the face side of jersey knitting, which is referred to a plain stitch, okay? And they look like little upside down Vs, right? 
Okay. Like so much so that when you are rendering a very fat, plain knit stitch, I literally tell my rendering students, draw fat, rounded Vs, upside down Vs. You see the little upside down Vs? Aren't they cute? All right. And then this is the revert. This is the pearl side. Okay. These are what pearl stitches look like. They look more wavy, more ramen noodle-y. So within the weft knit category, we have single knits and we have double knits. And in the single knit category, we have jerseys, okay, which are t-shirt knits. So when people say t-shirt knits, they usually mean jerseys or baby ribs. I'll get to baby ribs in a second, but jerseys, you know, standard t-shirt material. If you're wearing a t-shirt right now, it's probably a jersey. Um, you can make jerseys out of cotton. These are modals, okay, and modal blends. I forget who I got these swatches from, but here's a micromodal spandex. You can kind of see the spandex core. It's kind of shiny. Here is a silk modal blend. Okay. And here's a cotton modal. And you can see the cotton is a little bit more matte because cotton just, it's soft, it's fuzzy, it's more matte, you know, that sort of thing. You know, jerseys, they're popular, they're drapey, they're versatile, they're soft, you know, they can be very lightweight, they can be quite, quite a bit heavier, um, but they also shrink really easily, they roll at the cut edge, oh my God, it makes me bananas. Oh, I hate cutting jersey because, like, really flimsy jerseys like this. Because look at I'm not doing anything with it, and it just curls. Okay, these stickers are put on the back of the swatches, and jerseys always curl towards the face. It's super annoying. The most annoying. Ah. Here is a single jersey, okay? And you can see, I don't know. I hope the camera can pick up. That's the face, that's the back. Can you see the difference? The knit stitches in the front, pearl in the back. Do you see the difference there? Okay, so there's jerseys. And then, so knit jer jerseys have knit stitches in the front, pearl stitches in the back. Jerseys are flimsy and they snag easily. You should probably use a ballpoint needle with them. And then you have matte jerseys that are made out of uh, very twisted, high twist crepe yarns. Okay, so it has like a slightly crepier surface and they drape beautifully, they're heavier. Okay, and it's really used for dressier clothes. You see these like kind of slinkier matte jersey, drapey little dresses and blouses, that kind of thing. Gathers well, all that fun stuff. Here's a silk jersey. It's a little bit shinier. See, this is a Georgette. There's Organza. This is Habitai. See how high shine? And can you see the stitches? Knit stitches. And then pearl stitches on the back. See the difference there? Knit, pearl. I have info on all these books in the description box, so pop that box open if you want to check out the titles and author names. Point tail knits are uh, knits where you have a pattern created by a series of spaces. So here, this one is probably the best example. Do you see how there are these patterns created with spaces? And, you know, you have to use kind of like a fine yarn with a tight knit structure so that the spaces kind of don't lose the pattern, right? If the whole fabric is very loosely structured, then, you know, the pattern of the holes kind of falls apart, doesn't retain the original pattern very well. So double knits. The number one double knit would be rib. So rib knit. You see a lot of this sort of thing. You have like really baby fine uh, sort of t-shirt knits that are made out of rib. People call this baby rib because it's very, very teeny weeny. And uh, you have this kind of rib knit. 
So it's like knits for a couple of stitches and then purl stitches for a couple of stitches, knit stitches, purl stitches, and that's how you create the ribs, right? And when somebody says two by two rib, it means two knit stitches and then two purl stitches, two knit stitches, two purl stitches. And then when someone says three by one rib, that means three knit stitches, one purl stitch, three knit stitches, just like that. You can have like super fine gauge knits where the rib is imperceptible. It almost looks like a jersey from far away, but the fabric will be more durable. You also have a rib knit with elastic that's often used for banding. And I've, I've worked with a lot of this kind of banding because uh, I used to design a lot of varsity jackets. And so we used to buy uh, special cut banding for collars, cuffs, and waistbands. And that's nice because you can get those things to fit the body without precise measurements because they're so stretchy. And it's nice to have those on outerwear because because it fits close to the body, it doesn't um, let the wind in, okay? It's nice for colder weather. Rib is also nice for socks because it, again, compresses to the body without it being like super tight, you know? Another common double knit is interlock. Do you see how the front and the back of an interlock looks almost identical? Okay, because the way it's knit, you don't have the pearls in the back. This is a jersey, and you can see the knits in the face and pearls in the back. Interlocks are, they don't stretch as much in the length. They do stretch more in the cross. Okay, they are more stable, they're firmer, they hold seams better, they're less likely to stretch out. And you see them a lot in polo shirts, you know, the ones that look like t-shirts but have a collar with little buttons. Now here's a cool rib swatch. Okay, you can see when you stretch it out how many stitches are in the knit and how many are in the purl. The little upside down Vs, those are the knit stitches, the ones that look kind of like horizontal waves, those are your purl stitches. Double knits, when you just call them double knits as the fabric, most people associate them with thicker uh, bottom weight sort of knits. Uh, they were really popular in the 60s and 70s with these little shift dresses and just kind of like uh, sort of casual, easy, tailored bottom weights and jackets. Like I wear a lot of vintage 60s dresses, like little shift boxy 60s dresses in these um, double knits, and they hold that boxy shape really well. You know, it's not, they're not slinky like jerseys. Uh, here's a double knit PK. PKs have a texture, a distinct texture. Like this is a, this is your standard kind of normal double weight, a Ponte de Roma. Nice, smooth, even surface. And PKs have a distinct raised texture. You know, they're not as stripey. They're firm. They're resilient. They're easy to cut and sew. Okay, they don't roll like jersey. Oh, cutting jersey is like the worst. And a lot of these can be reversible. Double knits also refer to when you have two knits and they've been kind of either fused or knit or stitched together so that it's a reversible fabric. Okay, even if it's two knits that are single knits and then they've been stuck together, people consider those double knits as well. So there's just like this whole category of double knits and you have to be, the whole point of knowing all this information is so you can be more specific. So we have these super fine gauge, lightweight, drapey sweater knits. And then you have your medium, uh, medium weight sweater knits. And where you can more easily see the stitches. Okay, with fine gauge, it's like, uh, it's like they're distinctly thicker than t-shirt knits like jersey and interlock, but they're still, you know, they're distinctly sweater knits, but they're super fine gauge. And then you have a medium weight, and then you have like super chunky heavyweight where you can easily see individual stitches. The yarns are quite fat and you're really playing with the texture. Okay, super fun, happy, good times. And 
we'll get more into different kinds of stitches when you have like really visible texture and stuff in a future video. Did I cover all the weft knits? Yeah, I did. <laughs> so moving on to warp knits. Warp knits are more rigid in the straight grain and are divided into trico knits and Rochelle knits. And trico knits, they are uh, often used in inner linings and linings, lingerie, underwear, swimwear, and athletic apparel. Trico has Tricos have smooth surfaces, usually fine gauge, dense stitches, they snag easily. They roll when cut, but not as bad as jerseys. Okay? They're often slightly sheer and uh, they're drapey, but more durable uh, than jerseys, which is kind of what makes them good for lingerie. Some of the most common tricos are power stretch knits for athletic gear, cycling shorts, speed skating outfits, swimsuits, pantyhose. Those are all power stretch. Like they're strong and you can stretch them quite a bit and they kind of snap back into place. And which make, that's what resilience means. Resilience used in a technical way is when you can pull something and then it snaps back really easily. Okay. That's something that's resilient. Okay. Underwear, trico knits, power stretch. Again, underwear needs to be resilient. You know, it needs to snap back to its original shape after it's been stretched around your butt. Right? So resilience is good. Trico is good for that. Trico is good for underwear. Okay. Also for power mesh. Okay. Here's some mesh inserts and a corset using power mesh. Men's briefs. This power mesh brief is designed for quick dry laundering when traveling. The open mesh fabric is cool for hot climates and the fit is less restrictive due to the function of the garment. Mm, that's what tricots are good for. <laughs> this one that I'm referring to a lot, this one is the Fashion Designers Textile Directory. I'm not saying this is the best fabric book I own, um, but this one has been really invaluable to me of late. This one is the knitwear design book. I'm going to be using a lot more in future knit uh, videos. You know I love the swatch book, the Fabric for Fashion swatch book. I also have the accompanying Fabric for Fashion textbook. Rochelle knits are open work knits. They do, you can have Rochelle lace knits, nettings and meshes, uh, netting is a Rochelle knit and tool is a type of netting. It is the softest kind. It has the smallest spaces and the finest yarns often used with silks to create wedding veils. And even if it's used as a structural kind of underskirt sort of thing, it's not very stiff. So you can have a very soft structure. This is Pont d'Esprit and you see this a lot in hats. Okay. And Pont d'Esprit has the very wide open spaces and then like little flecks of another texture. Often these kind of spots, okay, large whole net. And you have all kinds of like crinolines and nets and things. You know, you can, you can use silks for kind of soft uh, hand and soft structure, or you can use something that's made out of nylon if you really need to put it under like a heavy fabric and still get the shape. Okay, so pick your fibers accordingly. And then with nets, because of the way it's twisted, it doesn't fray. So you don't need any seam finishing, you don't need any hemming, you just cut it nicely and you're good to go. You don't even need to laser cut or anything. Here are a couple of Rochelle knits that are lacy. Do you, I think this one is quite pretty. Okay, it's a little, it has a little bit of give, especially in the bias, but it's, it's not really meant to be like a compression mesh or really strong, um, stretchy thing. It's pretty delicate overall, but the design is rather intricate, but you can see the stitches, the knit stitches, the warp knit stitches which is very different from like the Jersey little upside down V's or the pearls. Here's another example of the Rochelle knitted lace. This, uh, this is also Allenson lace, uh, AKA corded lace, uh, which has the cord running along the design, but you can see how they're knit 
parts of it look like mesh. If uh, you watch my lace rendering video, I'm like, well, every lace is flowers and mesh, mesh and flowers. And so you have your flowers and you have your mesh and you put in your flowers and you put in your mesh, right? So you can see the knit pattern of the mesh and then you have the flowers. It's a little bit stretchy. And then, I bet you thought we were done. No. And then... <laughs> And then we have a few fabric categories that can be done in with weft knits or with warp knits. And in no particular category, we have the mesh category, athletic meshes, apparel meshes. I think that we've all seen something like this. Sports jerseys are made out of this kind of mesh. Large holes, medium holes, small holes, okay? So depending on your individual needs and whether you're going for more apparel look or more athletic look, these can be done with both. Uh, you can create them with a trico or you can do a single or double weft knit meshes. So when you have pile fabrics like carpet, velvet, velour, fleece, okay, what happens is this. You have a base fabric, whether it's woven or knit, you know, here's your length grains, here's your cross grains, or here's your looping knits. Okay, you have your base flat fabric. And then you have another set of yarns that sticks straight up. And the deeper, the longer these yarns are the plusher the deeper the nap is and more distinct nap you ever vacuum a carpet and you push the hairs in, the yarns in one direction and it the color looks slightly different so you can tell where the vacuum tracked okay in a smaller softer way velvet velour fleece those are all the same way that's why when you cut these napped fabrics these pile fabrics you have to pay attention to the direction or it'll look weird because you might have all like let's say you're cutting a velvet jacket and like you cut one sleeve going the wrong direction the color is always going to look off on that one sleeve because the yarns are going in a different direction so when you cut these patterns right you know how when you cut patterns Let's say you have a sleeve pattern and you have your, and you know how they tell you to put a double arrow on your green? You know what that means? That means that this pattern can be cut on the marker. It can be cut going this way or it can be cut going this way. Oops. So your marker maker knows that they can rotate it as long as it goes along the grain, they can rotate it to fit the fabric. But when you have nap fabrics, you need all your pattern pieces going in the same direction. And so your top, your sleeve, whatever, right? They all need to be going the same direction so that the napped fabric top all looks like the same color. And then your marker maker knows that he can't rotate these around on the marker. And the cutter knows that they all need to be going the same direction. So that is a consideration in design and in costing because it's going to take more fabric because the marker maker can't manipulate the patterns by rotating. Okay, so those are all things to think about. Another category of fabrics that can be warp or weft knit is polar fleece. Polar fleece is uh, often used in outdoor gear. It has a cut pile face where you have fibers that stick straight up from the base of the fabric. And I mean, the fibers are super short, so you're not going to see the individual little yarns unless you get your hand face up super close. Okay, so it has a cut pile surface and then the back is brushed. So everything is very soft and warm and spongy, right? It's bulky, it always feels soft often used for this kind of pullover for bigger jackets, also linings for thicker winter gear. And the thing with polar fleece is it is a napped fabric because it's a pile fabric. And so you have to pay attention to the direction of the fabric when you are cutting and sewing. And another category of fabric that can be done warp or weft knit 
is velour. Okay, there's knit velour and there's woven velour. Woven velour tends to be stiffer and more durable and often used for interior design and outerwear. And knit velour is less expensive, more widely available. Uh, it's plusher has a deeper nap than velveteen. Velveteen tends to be uh, thinner and crisper. Okay, we have velvet, velour, and velveteen. And uh, velvet, true velvet, is a woven. This is pan velour, where it's all crinkled and textured. Most people call them pan velvets, but they're wrong. It's velour, okay, because velvets are only wovens. Burnout in velours and velvets are when usually so you have all your velvet and they lay down a chemical to burn away some of these fibers. So, you know, if you wanted a wavy pattern, you would apply the chemical here and it would burn away those fibers and these areas, you see the burnout areas, they'll be sheer. All right, who is done for the day? That was a lot. I hope you took notes. Did you take notes? You should have taken notes. Or you could just watch again and take more notes. <laughs> As usual, please hit the thumbs up button if you found this video helpful or entertaining or amusing, uh, if you learned some cool things, and if you would like more fabric videos in the future. And do leave me all your comments and questions about knit fabrics in the comment section below. Don't forget to pop open that description box for info on the books that I referenced in this video. And uh, yeah, share, subscribe with all of your fabric junkie friends, your fashion design friends, and uh, I will see you in the next video.